Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started because we have an awful lot to talk about in the next hour. Uh, so welcome everyone. Really glad that you're with us this morning. Thank you for making the time for this very important topic. Um, my name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director of Be a Part of the Conversation. We're a nonprofit in southeastern Pennsylvania. We serve five counties, including Montgomery County. They are our host today and our partner in this and our funder, and we are very grateful to them. Um, today's program um, is funded as part of the Youth Marijuana Prevention Project. This is a five-year um, initiative that started a year ago in July. So we're just in the start of our second year. And this is something we've been really looking forward to. Uh, so really very grateful to have you all with us today. Thank you for being a change maker in the state of Pennsylvania. So I wanna let you know that we are recording this presentation. Um, we are, you are all in just viewing mode only, so we cannot see or hear you. Um, we're only going to be recording the presentation portion of this. We'll stop recording when we get to the Q&A section. We don't want anyone to feel at all intimidated to ask questions, but just so you know, if you're asking questions throughout the program um, during um, Val's or Ben's presentations, um, you will, we will not be, the recording will not pick up those questions. They will just be, um, you know, within this, this meeting. So don't worry about that. Um, the link uh, to the recording will be available later today. So <clears throat> we have this program scheduled to go until 9.30. But uh, Ben Cord, our featured presenter today, has agreed to stay on with us. Um, he originally talked about an hour, maybe 30 minutes. Where his schedule's getting a little bit crazy today, but if need be, he'll stay on for at least a half an hour after this program um, if there are additional questions that aren't answered. Also, um, there's a, a page on our website that we've dedicated to this program and this topic. Uh, our website is, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, conversation.zone. Uh, if you go to conversation.zone slash lead, as in taking the lead, then you'll find the follow-up page, which will have the recording of the presentation this morning. It will also have loads of other information. We have a Q&A section where we'll try to get to some of the topics that are, or some of the questions that are coming up that um, we've already noticed in the advanced questions that many of you submitted that there are some themes and a lot of really great questions about the developing adolescent brain and all of that. Lots of information will be on our site about that. And it's there right now, What's not there yet is of course the recording because we're live. Uh, and also this is something that we're doing um, separately from our, our um, agreement with the, the county, but this is something we're presenting. Ben has graciously agreed because we know that we have a lot of questions out there. He's graciously agreed to come back and visit us in October on the 15th. Uh, we're calling it Lessons Learned from Colorado because as you will find out, Ben Court is um, a marijuana policy expert from the state of Colorado. So he certainly has a lot of lessons to share with us. So we're grateful that he will be with us on that date. At the same time at 8.30, we're gonna make that an 8.30 to 10 a.m. presentation. So um, we'll have information about how to join that meeting uh, soon. And that'll be on the follow-up page as well. Um, we also have a program coming up. This is part of the Youth Marijuana Prevention Project. Uh, this is at the end of October, the 27th. Cannabis, it's complicated, especially for kids. So we will be talking about uh, the way marijuana cannabis impacts that developing teenage brain. We will have someone in recovery from cannabis use disorder with us. We'll have a clinician talking with us. So I think that should be very interesting. I just want to give you a very brief snapshot, snap, snapshot of um, what marijuana use is looking like in Pennsylvania these days. And I know that we have some prevention providers with us, so you've seen this before, but I think all of us need to just have a quick look at this. Past 30-day use, um, it, the, the Pennsylvania Youth Survey is done every two years in grades 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th. So we're looking at 2015, 2017, and 2019. So it's the same population being surveyed every other year. And when we look at this in Pennsylvania, past 30-day use, this is not lifetime or past year, but past 30-day use of marijuana, you can see uh, you know, 12th graders are up to about 20% of them uh, are over the last six years have been using um, uh, cannabis. If you look at vaping, of course, this is something that wasn't even measured uh, before 2015, but you can see how it has increased 
um, in the last three or the last three surveys that were taken, you can see that the use has gone up in vaping. When students who said that they were vaping were asked which products they're vaping, um, when we, then when asked about marijuana or hash oil, oil these are the numbers um, of students who were vaping in the past year indicated that they were using marijuana or hash oil. There's a lot of other data and we have the full PAYS uh, report on our website on that follow-up page. So we encourage you to check that out. We also have the Montgomery County results there as well. So at the end of this program, when we're finished, um, you will have an opportunity that something will pop up on your screen inviting you to take our survey. We really appreciate you doing that because it helps us to know if we've been effective, what else you might need to hear from us in the future. Um, and we really encourage you to do that. It helps us tremendously in our future programming. And just a reminder to follow up on that page on our website. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Val Arkush. She is uh, the chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. So I will stop sharing my screen and say welcome to you, Dr. Arkush. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're muted, Val. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. And Kim, it's so great to see you. Uh, and I want to thank you and be a part of the conversation for putting this uh, really important discussion together this morning. Be a part of the conversation is such a critical partner in the work that we're doing in Montgomery County through our Office of Drug and Alcohol uh, around a number of issues around substance use disorder and other challenges across our community. So just want to thank you for convening all of us and to thank all of you that are attending this morning. Uh, at an early time on a Friday morning. I know there were close to 300 people registered and it looks like you know the vast majority of them have signed in. And uh, I'm particularly happy as I was scrolling through the attendee list to see so many members of our Montgomery County uh, uh, community that uh, I know uh, individuals that work for the county across multiple different departments. Uh, we've got members of law enforcement on this call, uh, members of and representatives of different community groups. So I just wanna thank all of you for participating. I do believe this is an issue that affects uh, all of us uh, and is one that is something that is actually very complicated <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Um, there are issues around youth use, particularly as Kim has already mentioned, the developing brain, but this also dovetails with it, uh, issues of social justice and criminal justice in our communities. And there's been, we know historically, very real impacts there as well. So this is a complicated issue. And I'm very uh, grateful to hear Ben Court's perspective on this issue. I have been, as you all know, I'm a very data-driven uh, individual. I'm a physician as a, uh, by background, for those of you who don't know me. And I have been very interested in watching what has happened in Colorado over the last several years. So uh, I'll be interested to hear the latest uh, on October 15th, and we'll definitely try to tune in for that. But um, I think it's really important that we see what's happened in other places, both good um, and also things that are cautionary notes. And that if we do end up moving forward in, in the state of Pennsylvania with some sort of legalization of uh, non-medicinal use of cannabis, I think it's just very important that we look and see how that's gone in other states and what can we learn from that here. So I'm very grateful to have this conversation, very interested to hear uh, the multiple perspectives on this issue. And Kim, again, just wanna thank you for your leadership on this issue. It's been so important to our community. Thank you so much, Dr. Krish. Really appreciate you being here and for your kind words. Um, ben, I'm not gonna do a big introduction because I know people will learn about you on our website. We have your bio there, um, but Ben has presented with us many times. You can find other videos of his on our YouTube page, which I'll also be sharing. Um, but if you wanna unmute and say hello to our guests and we'll let you get started. Thank you so much, Ben. Great, unmuting. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Akush and Kim, of course, thank you. I'm sorry that uh, this is virtual. Um, I'm always excited when Kim calls because uh, my, my little sister is in Upper Bucks. And uh, so every time I, I do something with um, Kim and her amazing organization, I get to go and 
stay there and make a little bit of trouble with uh, my 11 year old nephew. Um, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. You would think that after all of this time doing, um, <laughs> doing this, I'd be better at it. So Kim, just to clarify, so um, I know we were going to go until uh, 9.30 and then we're going to open to questions. Is that correct? Correct. Um, well, we were going to have you try to get to questions earlier than that if we can, because we've, we've told folks that we would have this program from 8.30 to 9.30. So if we can wrap up before 9.30, that would be great. Um, and we're looking at your desktop right now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Um, 30 minutes to discuss this subject uh, means that you got to get ready to drink from a fire hose, even if I'm going to be judicious in what I'm going to um, share with you. As we went through all of the questions and as uh, I've had conversations with people in Pennsylvania, um, it, it was my wife's from there. It's uh, where we met and we're married. Uh, I know the state well. Um, I, I tried to figure out a couple of things that might be of the most interest to you. Uh, and as we were doing this, even just getting into the uh, couple of highest level points that might be of interest, I told Kim, there, there's just no way we can do any of the justice. So um, I'm asked if I could come back. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of weeks to do more. But I'm also going to give you some resources at the end because the reality is that. Um, when we made this decision in Colorado, we did not have anyone uh, who went ahead of us. And that, that means that we weren't able to look at and consider uh, a real world application. Um, you in Pennsylvania are able to do that with multiple different states. And, and the trick is like anything that is politics. I mean, my goodness, in a presidential election year, uh, this is uh, a factor of 10. Like anything that is politics, uh, a lot of the times the information gets drowned out by the, the volume of the voices that are yelling it. Um, so I have always attempted to stay apolitical in this. Kim, did you have something? Yeah, your audio is a little bit um, choppy. I don't know if there's anything you can do on your end. I'm not sure if you're using, your, I don't see earbuds, but just so you know, you're a little choppy. I'm not using. Okay. I'm not using it. Okay. Um, is it distracting enough that I should shut applications down and things? I don't think so. I would keep going. All right. I'm not going to move except for to advance the screen. So uh, all of that time wasted to tell you I'm not going to waste much time on this. I'm going to try and go quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, listen, the, the bottom line is that um, – <laughs> You absolutely have to make sure that we're looking at real and valid information because of the money involved in this and because of the, the deep, deep politics here, uh, a lot of what happens ends up being spun pretty hard by both sides of this. And here were a couple of different, decent places to start that I thought you might be interested in because um, there's such solid uh, data. So, so real science is journal published and peer reviewed. Real science is, is not a survey. Uh, I have very little interest most days in what 62% of America believes. Because last time I checked, a uh, majority of this country thought that The Bachelor was the best show on television. Kim, am I having trouble here? Yeah, a little right bit. Here? And I also want to make sure that you're not showing a PowerPoint right now, correct? Because we're still looking at your, your, death, your, fault, your folders. I am showing a PowerPoint. We're not saying it. We're just All in right, your folders. I don't know why your audio is still kind of choppy. Uh, do I? And, um... Kim, can you see this? Yes. And any better on the audio? Well, right now it is. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. There you go. All right. I apologize, everybody. No, um, no. Yeah, I should have stopped you. 
Uh, stupid internet. I know. All right. So these are a couple of nice studies for you to consider at first. Um, but again, there are quite a few. Uh, my um, personal belief in this is that you should always give these things a little bit of time to breathe because what will happen a lot of times is a, a preliminary uh, data summary will be released on Monday and by Tuesday you've got people writing articles about it saying that it was the silver bullet that each side was waiting for. Um, so I, I kind of like to give the science a little while to breathe, but these are a couple of really nice places to start. The reason why I, I so prefer um, the meta study that Dr. Volkov gave here is that it's a summary of um, all things known up until about 2014 uh, about cannabis. And I think the most important one that we have considered is the one that's bold, originally published February 2015. Please, please look into this one. It's called The Effects of Hypotensive Cannabis on Psychosis. Uh, and that's published in Lancet, and there have been multiple follow-ups since. So the most important thing that you have to understand uh, and, and what happened in Colorado was that cannabis changed fundamentally. And this is the new school cannabis. It's not what you smoked in the 70s. I hope that you can see see this. Kim, just give me a thumbs up, making sure you can still see my screen. Now I'm all tech self-conscious here. Um, what we did in Colorado was not simply decriminalized. And um, here's just pure uh, opinion on this. I've always been somebody who's been comfortable with and, and even advocated for the decriminalization of. Uh, what we did was we uh, opened up a full commercial market to. And as you know, uh, this country does commercial markets very, very, very well. So fundamentally what happened uh, in Colorado was the advent of a new, um, really a new substance. I mean, it's cannabis based substance, but uh, our market is not made up of the plant anymore. The plant plays a role in it, but it's um, products that are based on the plant. So uh, let me explain to you a little bit what happened here. So Colorado voted in 2012, in 2014, January 1, 2014, we opened up retail. So these data are um, absolutely beautiful. And unfortunately, we have not seen a continuation and it doesn't look like we will see a continuation uh, because of some, some poor decisions made at the federal level. Um, but beginning in 1960 and ending in 2011, uh, the University of Mississippi uh, tracked a representative sample of all of cannabis confiscated inside of America. And as you'll see, you see this, this red line right here is THC. So THC is, is the psychoactive ingredient inside of cannabis. If you don't have THC, you have hemp. Uh, you have a very interesting textile that makes my favorite shoes and um, used to make a lot of rope and, and probably has a lot of other uses than that. But no THC, no high. More THC, no high. A little oversimplified, but that's all we got time for this morning. So as you'll see, uh, beginning in 1960 and steadily rising until 2011, we got more THC bred into our marijuana. And the reason why is that we like to get high around here. And uh, this is a country that supersizes its big mass. And if one is good, <laughs> two is definitely got to be better. So... Um, the thing that I'd like to point out to you before I switch slides, especially to those of you who are a little more interested in the science of this, uh, is that if you look back to 1960 here, we're going to follow this line into perpetuity, uh, backwards to perpetuity. We're, we're going to look at this um, into, you know, crawling out of the ocean or coming down from trees or walking out of the garden or, or whatever you like. Um, that line would have stayed the same because what naturally occurs inside of cannabis is somewhere between a point two and point. 5% THC. Um, that's what humankind has been interacting with for millennia. Uh, and what we started to do was, of course, there were exceptions to mm -hmm. that, particularly in certain religious traditions. Ben, Kim? I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, the, we're, we're getting some complaints about the sound. So it's just very hard to hear. So I'm wondering if you could try um, signing in from your phone, like keep your audio on, mute yourself, and then, and then if you can join from your phone, would you mind trying that? Not at all. A couple of people have made that suggestion, so perhaps they've experienced this as well. You can continue to share your screen and all that. It's just that the audio, yeah.
I apologize, folks, hang in there. And you know, when we talked with Ben, when we were getting started, he sounded perfectly crystal clear. And the three of these that I do a day have all worked out great until now. <laughs> of course. Are you able to get signed in, Ben? On your phone? Uh, yeah, but I've joined it as an attendee. I, I wonder if this has gotten any better at all and if I can try to keep going. It sounds okay way. right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, can maybe Katie, could you send me another link so it's at the top of my uh, Here, inbox awesome. and or, or Kim, sorry, and if we have to switch back over, we will. Okay. All right. Keep on going for now. Okay. If you can see, uh, everybody good on the slide? Kim, you see it? You guys, okay. So what happened then uh, was the introduction of the commercial market. And again, the continuation of these data looks highly, highly unlikely, as does the continuation of data uh, from Colorado, which is um, very frustrating. So what you see here if you go back, uh, we were looking at increments of 2.5 over the course of 50 years. And as we move here to increments of five, uh, just to get that in, the blue line is Colorado. And unfortunately, we probably won't see a continuation of that past 2016 because those of you who are a little more science minded, public policy minded, um, there has been a very, very poor job of actual data collection. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of interest in determining um, what's what's really happening inside of the substance. We pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the sales of it, but not in the actual growth of the substance. So um, if you'll look at the green line beginning in 1960, the, um, the bottom line to this, and what I like to, to kind of tell folks is I think that what we did in Colorado is taught you how to turn a plant into a drug because there is... The difference between a 0.2%, 2%, 10% see, and a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% uh, is profound. And part of the problem is that uh, very, very little uh, was known about what concentrations that high were doing inside of the human brain and body. And the science is still fairly emergent, uh, but we do know what it's doing from a mental health standpoint, and it's very, very concerning. Um, so if for no other reason, um, I, I show you this, to show you that what most people perceive this to be, which is a market about a plant that's fairly benign. The plant used to be pretty benign. Um, and the, the roots of why we criminalized it at the beginning uh, were insidious. They, they were racist to their core, uh, up here. However, we're not talking about that plant anymore. Uh, we're now talking about a, a pretty well-developed substance uh, that there's huge commercial interest in. This is what happens when we go from uh, good farming 
to a chemistry when it goes from the the folks up the street uh, with a couple of acres to Monsanto. Uh, and there is not an interest in the industry's part for um, sustainable farming practices for um, moderate products. There's an interest in some more and more of what they, they have. So let me shift really quickly here to share with you as Dr. Kushan, and any other physician on uh, board knows well that the diagnosing of addiction is, is not something that can be done uh, subjectively. Uh, one must meet diagnostic criteria. There are 11. Um, it, so here are the 11. I'm, I'm afraid we're not going to take time to unpack this, but what I need you to understand is that addiction, the field in which I work, um, is not diagnosed arbitrarily. Like any other medical condition, you have to meet objective criteria. And when it comes to understanding uh, addiction to THC, to cannabis, um, we should be saying THC, not cannabis as a whole, uh, to THC, DSM, which is the manual that the physicians and mental health professionals find all of their uh, criteria in. Uh, four years ago, when DSM-5 came out, actually uh, listed cannabis withdrawal as a diagnosis for the first time ever. So that's the, the physical withdrawal for THC. Which, I mean, like 10 years ago, if somebody was talking about withdrawal from cam cannabis, um, we probably meant that they were eating way, way, way less cheese and goldfish and Yanni's music sucked again. Um, they weren't physically withdrawing from anything. But the simple fact that in the last couple of years, we now have changed the substance to lunch, um, a, a person is can now be physically dependent on is a really big deal and should make us all sit up and the, the side of this is it's just weed it's just weed it's just weed um that's where i would challenge you that it, it was just weed it was just a plant and for a long long time that argument was true but hey it simply isn't because the plant that humankind interacted with from millennium um, has been replaced by something pretty significant. So uh, going back to considering the addiction, the addictive potential of this, here's some simple numbers for you. Uh, when Colorado opened up retail in 2014, we had fewer than 300 uh, licensed cannabis facilities in the state of Colorado. As of last year, we don't have any data for 2020 yet. As of last year, that number went to 2,709. Um, so that's a pretty significant factor. Uh, it's a, a factor of about nine uh, that it's grown in five years. And so the, the reality to this is that the only way that we can continue to support this amount of growth is we have a market that grows with it. And there are only two ways to market. Uh, this is Econ 101. Um, there's only two ways to grow a market. It's one, you capture new users, or two, you convert current users to more frequent users. Now, the problem is with an addictive substance or a substance with potential addictive properties, which cannabis simply is um, objectively, you can't argue that without um, throwing the science out of it, less addictive than some things, more addictive than others. Um, the reason why this matters so much is that the majority of the market ends up being made up by the problem user. So what we've always seen with alcohol and tobacco sales uh, in, in about 60 years worth of tracking these data is, is that uh, roughly 20% of the consumer population will consume about 80% of the commercial sales of those. Um, the alcohol industry is, is not interested at all in my wife and her occasional glass of wine with dinner. They do, however, love the guy who found Mad Dog 2020 when he was 12 years old. Um, but Unfortunately, I'm being the game I got so in Colorado, the last data that we have from 2017 shows us that 84% of the THC in Colorado uh, is being consumed by 20% of the consumers. So when you unpack who those consumers are, that's why it's important to understand the addictive part is the, the vast majority of this market is not made up of, uh, despite what the advertisements would tell you, what we would love to tell them, show the world. 
the it's not made up of people who look like me going home after work trying to decide between a nice bottle of Merlot or an edible. Um, it is made up of the problem user. And the problem user, uh, as, as the one who drives that market, you have to understand who they are because they are my people. Uh, I work inside of, of uh, chemical dependency treatment. Um, I'm someone who has some long-standing mental health issues. I've worked with, worked through myself, uh, depressive disorders, as well as PTSD. And the, those of us with um, mental health conditions, the minority population, both sexual minority as well as ethnic minority, um, and the lower income communities in Colorado are the ones who make up that 20%. Now, here's where I will um, tell you that there's maybe an opportunity for collaboration, Kim, uh, between uh, your lovely organization and uh, if, if you guys should move forward with this in Pennsylvania, what, what might happen um, is I, I know how interested you guys are in preserving the, the minds of the kids in the state. I know you guys love kids. What we have found in Colorado is so does the cannabis industry. Because when you are, are considering the three factors that will put somebody into this group of people consuming 84%, to build the problemed user, i.e. the better consumer, there are three factors. Well, there's four, but we can't control anything to do with genetic predisposition. Um, yeah. um, those three factors are age of onset, frequency of use, and THC potency. So the earlier someone starts, the more frequently they use, and the stronger the substance is, the more likely they are to be, from my perspective, a problem user, from the industry's perspective, a reliable customer. And this is the same as it has always been with addictive substances. It's the same with um, opiates, it's the same with tobacco, it's the same with alcohol. And uh, the, the reality here is that we know better. And so that's why I encourage everybody to be, uh, to, to familiarize themselves with the signs and symptoms of substance use disorder so that you can get more used to asking the questions around GAC dependence. So let me just show you a couple of things that have happened in Colorado is to work to capture more users. That's actually Cookie Monster on the side of the dispensary down in Colorado Springs with a plate full of dope by the way. <laughs> now, they're not selling any five-year-old kid who's going to walk in there. Of course not. But, but what this is, is long-term hearts and minds campaigns. And this has been one of the hardest things to challenge here in Colorado <clears throat> is this generation who has grown up with this is the norm, uh, with, with uh, the, the smell and the sights and the everything as the norm. And then when they actually get, uh, and, and, you know, they've got 10 or 11, uh, uh, symptoms for cannabis use disorder, it's still it's normal to them. Like, well, it's not a big deal. We have facsimiles of things that are clearly used with, pardon me, people, young people. You know, here's the emoji store um, on, on, that's all cannabis related, not targeted towards adults. Here's actual back to school special uh, in Colorado. Um, this was the open house guide for high schools and junior highs uh, that we had uh, last year that they gave all the kids in Boulder County where I live. And as you'll see, the first page for open enrollment community, the, the first page had a half page um, color ad for new dispensary that was coming to town that was branded to look like a Starbucks. Um, here's a, a move-in special with CU Boulder, so specifically targeting um, uh, freshmen and sophomores. Just comes out of the back of the dope. Messages telling me to smoke weed every day. Um, don't forget to dab daily. There's really kind of no escaping this. And then, uh, again, messaging that the kids uh, here have grown up with is stay high. And um, it's changed the way that we have to interact with people in our hour here because this has always been the norm for them. Um, so just a, a very brief tour through here. So, so here are consumption trends because the majority of the market now, from a dollars and cents standpoint is made up of concentrates. And then after that, it's edibles. And, and, and this is why I say that it's not the plant anymore that we're talking about. Uh, sales of or green organic material that's dried out that you know, roll in a joint and smoke, they're there, but they're 
a, a much, much smaller part of the market. So uh, beginning in 2014, Marijuana Enforcement Division uh, has released an annual update. And for the first three years of it, uh, we didn't even consider concentrates in there. So if you're not familiar with concentrates, hang on a second, because I'm going to show you what the market looks like. Um, in 2017, report, the first time they actually report um, sales on it. So we, we, we did our market into three, right? We have our um, black market, our gray market, and our white market. Black market, completely under the table. Gray market, one that uh, is either grown legally and sold illegally or grown illegally legally and sold legally, and then our white market where everything above board is taxed. So inside of our white market, which is a, a, a smaller of the three, um, in 2017, we taxed the sale of just about 28,000 pounds of concentrate. And um, in 2019, that number moved to 40,000 pounds of concentrate. Now, the reason why that matters, if you can see the advertisement over here to the right, is um, th th it says the top line says more is not better. Cannabis concentrates are potent. Start by consuming a small dose about half the size of a pinhead or less. So at a recommended dosage of half the size of a pinhead, Selling 40,000 pounds is a really, really big deal. And this isn't fringe use. This is what the young people are initiating on. Um, it's what people are consuming multiple times a day. This is how we've had to change the way that we um, uh, discuss recovery from and absence of cannabis. Because to the younger generation, cannabis is concentrated. Um, and concentrates are up to 99.9% THC. So the reason why that Lancet study I mentioned at the beginning, the effects of high potency um, cannabis psychosis is so important is it has given us uh, um, kind of a long-term glimpse at a cohort um, using 16% THC and know what that's doing to their mental health. And it's um, uh, not good. Uh, the psychosis associated with and the mental health issues are a big deal. The reason why it's so important is we have very, very limited information above 16% potency because this is all happening so quickly. And if you consider that and then throw in here, um, here's 99% THC. Um, B, the uh, humankind. <laughs> knows very, very little about this substance, except for we know how to make it, we know how to sell it, <laughs> we know how to market it. We don't know a lot more about it. Um, it's gone very quickly. And this is, I go to the sensors all the time, not to consume, I'm sober, but to research. Um, and these are, this is called distillate. These distillates are absolutely everywhere. It's, um, you get, a, you, you get, um, you get basically free with purchase in a lot of different places. That's because this is something we're trying to move people toward. So we're, we're going to skip our videos. Um, I am going to show you some specific pictures of this commercial market. And as I do, I want you, any of you, I'm 41 years old, maybe over me, your mid 20s, consider that maybe, maybe what it is that we know are going to attempt to regulate is an old model T maybe get going 30 miles an hour downhill. When in reality, um, what we need to be considering and regulating and, and thinking about is, you know, the Bugatti that's ripping around at 140 miles an hour. Because when I was young, if you can see this, um, uh, can you see my cursor, Kim, where I'm kind of highlighting it here? Is that, okay, so this, that was we, that um, bud, this um, grown uh, TAT leaf, leaves trimmed off, we, that was we. But today, uh, this is almost a forgotten part of the market because the market looks more like butter and wax and shatter. Today, uh, the commercial market has grown so quickly to support the needs um, of those uh, of, of that small minority of people who are making up the majority of the market, that this is what weed looks like today. Um, here's something that we would probably call uh, uh, honey or honey oil. This would be in the 60%-ish. Uh, here's something called a live resin. Um, this is 60% ish The shatters are 
what pushed the upper limits, 80, 90 percent. Um, this is a, a live resin. This is not fringe use. This sort of thing is the majority of the market in Colorado. The market doesn't look like a plant. The market looks like the glues. So this is the distillate that I had mentioned before, the 99% um, pure. And this is really what we see everywhere. And, and where I challenge folks when they say it's just a plant, it's just a plant. Well, listen, concentrates are to weed what crack is to the cocoa plant. And it's, it's simple. Uh, this is not a plant. This is a re refined product from the plant. Here's what it looked like before it was cooled. If you can imagine the amount of scientific acumen that takes to go from a green organic material to this clear liquid, this is the 99%. And this is what's in every dispensary on every counter in Colorado. Um, the distillates are the beginning of our market. Uh, here's a syringe infused. Here's a, a sheet of chapter, you know, honey oil. I'm just wanting to give you an idea of what this actually looks like. Yet the um, the narrative remains this, that uh, it, it's natural. I just love this ad because I think it's a little bit more honest. Fueled by, or powered by science, fueled by nature. Based in something natural but really pretty scientifically advanced business. And um, no matter how hard you try, uh, and this is going to be a significant part of the market, and I don't care where you live in the country, this exists there. Uh, and this is what a lot of the young people are, are using and thinking about. So just through a couple of definitions in from last year's best of guide, uh, two years ago's best of guide, um, shatter and, and and uh, live resin and sauce. That's because I'm more than happy to share this presentation with anybody who wants it. Um, but, uh, oh, good. Here, here you go. Here's the definition of a distillate. A distillate's great. One of the more pure cannabis products on the market to stink cannabinoids down to molecular level uh, and delivering high TAC content. This process also allows certain cannabinoids to be isolated, generating different types of highs. Um, so what we actually are doing is separating THC to the sub-molecular level to isolate the L9 THC, pull the distillate out. It's very, very advanced stuff, and we've got good at it here. And these, these are just everywhere. Um, first one's free. <laughs> uh, this is just industry in America doing what industry in America does. They're not worse than or different than um, the other ones. They are just big business. So vaping, and quite a bit of information about this, Kim. So uh, go to the website, learn more about vaping. The only thing I wanted to tell you about that is there's no smoke, no smell, no mess. Um, so the majority of uh, the vaping that takes place is taking place because you can do it with impunity. You don't smell anything. Um, here, there's a good ad. Amazing fun flavors, no cannabis smell. And what people are, are vaping, now that you know a tiny, tiny little bit about concentrates, unpack concentrates, I usually take, it to take about two hours to really teach about them. Um, but uh, now that you know a little bit, you can look in here and see that that's clearly a concentrate oil. So most of what's being vaped, almost all of what's been vaped, um, is going to be some form of concentrate. And then our market supports these kind of incognito products, uh, the functional pen and the mug, the heat, or a cup that heats to 700 degrees that's great for the office, um, lighters and, and asthma inhalers. And then just for fun, there's your classic bubble gum flavor uh, that every game prevention jumps up and down about. So edibles. Um, the big issue with edibles is that we have not... Um, We've not managed to shut down the putting multiple servings inside of one package. Uh, and, and so what Colorado decided on um, was that 10 milligrams would make up um, a, a, a legally appropriate serving of, of edible. The issue is we didn't really have anything to base that on. Um, everybody has since based it on what we've done. For some people, 10 milligrams, they wouldn't even feel. Um, for other people, 10 milligrams is going to be enough to um, put them on the back side for um, uh, a day and a half. Uh, you, you, well, a day. 
you just don't know. There's so many factors involved in it. Uh, but the problem is that the, what Colorado has done is, um, and what everybody who's on since has done, because they keep asking, and of course, the politicians are like, we're awesome at this. We're the best. Colorado is fantastic at everything we do. Um, everybody's based what they've done on, on us. Um, these 10 milligrams are an issue because we put multiple servings inside of one package. So before I show you that, let me, uh, here, here, here's my challenge to you, Pennsylvania. Um, anything that can be introduced into the human body is being commercially produced in Colorado with the HC in it and in all the legal states because it's big corporations that are set up in all those states now. So any way we can introduce it to the human body is taking place with THC. So check this out. So here's a great example of, this is um, a gummy and this gummy size is really little and it has a hundred milligrams. So according to Colorado law, this has 10 legal servings inside of it. So this package would have a warning on it that says, um, hey, Colorado law separate each one into tenths. So one, nobody's doing this. And then two, the, the problem is we continue to do it by weight, even though we're not really considering potency with it, because the difference between 10 milligrams of um, organic material of bud and leaves and stem and seed and stuff like that, and 10 milligrams of a distillate is profound. And it's, again, we need new vernacular because it's not even the same thing. Um, to consider the, the plant in a distillate, yet we haven't kept up with it. So what we're, the problem is that people will ingest more than intended, obviously, uh, because there's 10 servings inside of something, you know, the size of half your finger, uh, and it's 10 servings is some really, really potent stuff. And once it's ingested, this is where the problems come from. And this is... Uh, no, nothing will solve it in the short term. Uh, activated charcoal induced vomiting, that will do it. You got to do, and I, I teach quite a bit on this, and there are much better minds than mine that have written on it. Uh, you can uh, uh, hijack intravenously, but you can short term antipsychotics are what we do. And we just sort of keep the person cool. Um, and a lot of the times that means keeping cool inside of um, a, a hospital environment because we don't want somebody having um, a acute psychotic episode and going out there and hurting themselves or others uh, because it processes very, very differently. The fact that this ends up going through your stomach and your liver and you can't stop it is very different than uh, entering your blood or your lungs. So here's a, another great example. This is a thousand milligram graham cracker. So this thing's the, the size of a graham cracker and it has a hundred people servings in it. I just uh, found this advertisement this week, um, up to a thousand milligrams in cake pops and sodas and gummy bears and chocolates. This is not a market focused on responsible adult use in the exact same way that the tobacco market isn't focused on responsible adult use. And the opiate market wouldn't have done what it did if the, the Sacklers and all those other people didn't figure out amazing ways to market that substance to everyone. This is specifically marketed and targeted to people who will have issues with it just like every other addictive substance. And for us to think that it's different, that this one time we're gonna do it magically different, we're still thinking. So here's some condiments, barbecue sauce and ketchup and coffee and K-cup coffee. These are all THC infused products. Here's the THC infused lemonade and THC infused hard candy, granola bars, wheat, ice cream, um, cans, uh, THC infused nasal mist. So you can just spray it in and get high and nobody will know anything. There's no smell. This is a really interesting new thing that started in the last three years. This is an intoxicating topical cream. It's not the CBD that you've got in your universe or your medicine cabinet. Um, this is a, a THC-based intoxicating um, topical. So you put it on, it, enter, <laughs> it goes to the layers of your skin, enters your bloodstream, gets you high. Here's a THC pill. 
or THC lollipops, particularly this one's at seven legal servings per lollipop in it. Uh, weed tea, or THC um, gummy, THC. So we have these things that are built to look like um, other classic candies, <laughs> obviously. This isn't a joke. I think a lot of the times people write things that aren't true. Uh, this, this is real. This is a pot box. Um, if you see down here, this is a pot rocks that can have up to 10 servings per. So like pop rocks, you, you know, um, sweet tarts and THC induced alcohol, THC infused soda. To me, this is one of the, the scariest ones because these have between 80 and 120 milligrams of sugar in them. And they clearly, clearly are not made to appeal to the adult. And these are very popular. Um, Keef Cola. If you want to watch something tonight, go uh, put Keef Cola into YouTube. You see that they have 350 milligrams of 35 legal servings. So in the back of this container, it says um, pour 135th, which is the app. And really, I'm, I want you to watch some of this on YouTube tonight because the young people, and they're young people, um, aren't consuming 135th. If you keep up with rap culture at all, here's THC syrup. THC juices. There you go. There is a THC infused water. <laughs> to me, this is kind of like maybe the top of what we have accomplished. Um, anyone, anywhere, anytime can be drinking THC. And none of y'all going to be the wiser. None of you school resource officers, um, none of anything. Uh, you pull somebody over on the road, they could pop in some THC gum just to get a good laugh out of it. Chai and mint and blah, 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 blah. I don't have time to go into all of these. There's caffeine and THC, THC underarm applicators, so THC deodorant, THC press sprays, THC sex lube, THC suppositories. Um, all of these remember that we have no FDA oversight whatsoever because it's a Schedule One controlled substance. Right, wrong, whatever, it's the reality. It's a Schedule One controlled substance. So FDA and the decades of consumer protection laws behind FDA do not apply. So I'd like to read this to you. This product, this is the back of a candy bar that I bought. Uh, this product contains marijuana and its potency was tested with an allowable plus or minus 15% variance. This product was produced without regulatory oversight for health, safety, or efficacy. You're not going to have the feds helping out with this. Uh, you're going to have to figure out how to, to keep this um, Regulated well. So listen, the mental health consequences, again, they're much, much better minds than I that have uh, written on and thought of this. So um, I'll give you a couple of resources at the end. But the bottom line is that um, it used to be very benign. And what we would see, uh, the case that we find in the literature, um, I, I wrote a book on this, I've written extensively on it, I, I, this is my world. Um, the cases that you would find in the literature where there were um, psychosis associated with cannabis use were rare. And they were people who had um, probably some pretty significant pre-existing conditions prior to. Like that fire was burning already. And that just got a little bit louder. Um, what we're seeing here is, is there's actually some um, good indications that some of these significant mental health issues um, is purely causal. It's not correlation, it's causal. All the citations are at the end if anybody's asking questions about that. But um, what we see with, with regular use of a 12% THC, um, regular use being um, twice a week, we see a twofold increased risk of psychosis. And you see a two and a half time increased risk in the diagnosis of schizophrenia um, if you use before 18. We see some very, very alarming trends. We see things that are like, like listen, if, if I were to show you these numbers, if I were to cut all of these numbers in half, and, and show to anybody uh, at, at FDA or the, uh, one of these big uh, governing government agencies and say, hey, you know, we found this to be true in a chemical inside of water bottles. Tomorrow, there will be a total ban on all those water bottles until we got to the bottom of this. Because right now, there's so many big unknowns and so many indicators that are, are scary from a scientific standpoint that we would love to have time to fully understand this. However, um, that doesn't work with the American way, which is, well, you did great last quarter. What are you going to show me this quarter? 
how much can they earn in 2020 versus 2019? So that's why we've got this big push and this money behind. So uh, there were quite a few questions about impairment and measuring that. So for law enforcement there, um, the biggest issues that we've got, and I know you're trained specifically in this, I provide postcards, I'd love to do this, uh, explain this to law enforcement. Impaired motor coordination, slow reactive time, and increased singular focus um, make it uh, a challenge for people to drive. And the problem is that we have no 0 .08. We do not have um, a way to determine intoxication roadside other than what we would call a DRE. Drug recognition expert, which is a law enforcement official specifically trained to recognize this intoxication. So the method of ingestion also makes uh, testing very, very tricky. And, and probably the world's thought leader, a, a, a brilliant um, a woman by the name of Marilyn Houston, uh, has told me that in all likelihood, I will not see um, a solid way to test intoxication um, in my lifetime because it's so complicated. So Colorado settled on uh, five nanograms per milliliter in your blood as intoxicated. However, we have multiple examples of people with 15 milligrams for stone cold sober. And an example actually right out the street from my old house of a young man who was um, two uh, nanograms per milliliter who can hold a, a six-year-old cross on the street and drug her forever who was stoned out of his gourd and he was half of the legal limit. So we have not figured out how to do a good job of um, actually testing this and, and we're quite a way a ways away from it. So here are a few resources for you if you're interested in the politics of it. There's SAM, the National Institute for Drug Abuse is not it. Um, SAMHSA, Smart Colorado is a group of parents who attempt to track data. And I will tell you that there are lots of other, and use a critical eye with all of them because the politics in this are insane. And what I will kind of leave you with is, is just because something has been politicized doesn't make a political issue. Uh, my opinion here is that this is a public health conversation and it's been it's been made into the political realm um, but it's really this is a conversation that should should be um, taking place with more of a public health eye and if you're interested in a not so great book um, but one that's maybe I think it's important. It's not really well written. Um, I, I wrote a book on this, and it's a, a Simon and Schuster brand. So here are your things, and I'm going to stop sharing and attempt to answer some questions. Take a breath. <laughs> And I really want to thank our attendees for hanging in. We, we really apologize for the audio. I know it was consistently choppy, Ben. I'm sorry to tell you, um, but, but thank you all for hanging in there with us. We do have a couple of questions that I want to get to quickly. Um, and by the way, Dr. Arkush has to jump off right about now. So um, thank you, Val. I think you're still here with us right now, but thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Kim, and, and thanks, Ben. Really, really interesting and eye-opening. So appreciate your time and uh, all your efforts. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks so much. All right, so Ben, can you have decriminalization without legal, first, let me stop and say it is 930. If you have to leave us, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put that link uh, to the follow-up page in the chat box. Or Judy, can you do that for me? Actually, if you can put the chat to everyone, um, find the link, send the, the hyperlink out to everybody um, for the lead page, conversation.zone. Sure, I'll yeah. do that. Thank you. Uh, so Beth, can you have decriminalization without legalization for recreational use? Yeah, Vermont did it, DC did it. Um, yeah, for sure. Great. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, well, hang on. Kim, before you do the next one, yes. let, let me just say that a lot of states have a de facto decriminalization. Colorado, um, possession of up to two ounces was a uh, $100 citable offense if anybody did it. So, yes, you can absolutely have decrim without commercialization. Great. Great. Okay. Um, can you repeat the name of the cannabis and psychosis study? And, and actually, maybe what I, we can say, too, is somebody else asked if we can share your PowerPoint on that follow-up page. And I know that your answer is going to be yes, because you always say yes. 
Um, so we can make sure, but do you know the study that she's, that they're referring to? Yes, um, the biggest and most interesting is called the Effects of High Potency Cannabis on Psychosis, originally published in the Lancet Journal, February 2015, volume two, number three. And it has been since updated annually. Got it. You are crystal clear now. I think it was the sharing for some reason. <laughs> God knows. knows. Okay. Um, ben, is the relationship to these mental health risks casual or causal? It's both. Um, it's it's both. Uh, well, one, you'll never fully be able to isolate if it's um, causation or correlation uh, for all of them. But there are several of them that we have absolutely isolated as causal. Um, and the correlation is um, something that's being worked out on, on both of them. Um, think about it this way. What we have determined uh, to be true in our world as a person, uh, this, this tends to make these issues much louder. Um, if they don't cause them, it makes them louder. But we have seen um, in, in the biggest study that was looked at in the last couple of years, a quarter of all of the psychosis isolated uh, was isolated as causal. All right, thank you. Uh, someone has asked what they can do to affect the decision regarding legalization in the state of Pennsylvania. I don't know. Talk to somebody who knows more about politics than me. <laughs> Contacting elected Call lawmakers, on obviously. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, can you explain the DUI requirements for marijuana? I've heard that if any amount is in your system, regardless of being from weeks ago, you can still get a DUI. And I know we have some law enforcement folks on if anyone wants to reply to that? Not, oh. not in Colorado. So you actually have to, um, it was a, a, a five nanograms per milliliter was what we decided on in Colorado, but that's been so successfully fought in court so many times um, that now you got to be really impaired. And realistically, people just aren't um, charging for that. If there's anything else law enforcement can charge with, they're, they're doing that because um, it's so hard to get a conviction for this. Um, so no, we, we don't have a sound 0.08. Okay, great. Um, Pennsylvania is looking to allow legal THC to bring in tax money to help with loss of money due to COVID. What I've read in states that, that uh, the state of Colorado is not making money off of THC, less than 1% of the state income is from THC, but they spend more money on police regulations and other expenses. Your thoughts, please. Well, um, less than half of a percent, actually. And I, I've written fairly extensively about this. You cannot tax a vice substance. You cannot tax any vice substance to a level that you will pay for the um, societal costs associated with it. We can't do it with booze. We can't do it with tobacco. With alcohol, um, for every dollar we tax nationally, uh, we lose about nine. With tobacco, for every dollar we tax, we lose about 11. You can't do it. So this is this is where the politics of this get incredibly frustrating to me because it's people like, well, let's make money. Let's make money. Um, you're stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime. And it, it's not about making money. In fact, our, our governor, uh, uh, Governor Hickenlooper, um, uh, former governor, uh, said multiple times, no state ever should do this for the money because there's not actually money in it. Yes, you will see more money coming into the coffers, um, but it's going to cost you so much more to get this done. And the percentages are tiny. I mean, we have a, a furlough on um, teacher raises. Uh, I, I'm sorry, a moratorium on teacher raises. We are um, cutting services inside of our law enforcement, inside of our fire departments, uh, inside of social services all over Denver because our budget shortfalls are so significant. Uh, and here where the state gross and all of this huge weed money. Uh, no, that's just, that's, that's hype and the politics of that are very frustrating to me. When people tell you that, challenge them to justify it. Got it. Um, question, what does DRE stand for regarding the test? A drug recognition expert. So that's a member of law enforcement who's been specifically trained uh, to recognize forms of intoxication of, of particular substances. Great. Um, are there efforts to make ads targeting children illegal as they did in the 90s? Um, this writer is old enough to remember the Joe Camel commercials being a cartoon. 
in, I remember that as well. Um, any efforts to curb that? Well, sure. Yeah. But every one of them is met with a uh, freedom of speech argument. And uh, there's also, okay, so, so here's the thing. There's a lot of what I can show you. I, I could show you illegal after illegal tactic, like the, the selling after 10 PM, for example, or drive-throughs or things like this. However, there is simply no bandwidth to police this. It's not like we've got this task force of folks who are going around and policing these 2,700 uh, facilities. Like we, we've got a handful of people inside of the marijuana enforcement division taxed with doing this. So uh, there, there's, a pretty big difference between saying you're, you're not allowed to do that and actually stopping somebody from doing it. Like, for, for example, we can't have billboards in Colorado. I could show you a picture of two dozen billboards. Uh, we can't have it on the sides of cars and buses like they do in Vegas, if you've been there. Um, same thing, I could show you dozens of pictures of buses uh, and, and cars with advertising on them. Um, the, there's this idea that... Um, <laughs> there's always this, been this idea that there's this um, omnipresent they out there somewhere that's going to enforce it. And um, right now in Colorado, what they're getting done doing is uh, going after the high level distributors and the um, organized crime that, that's behind this. Certainly not the folks who are advertising using cartoon characters. That's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot of tort in the same way it did with tobacco. <laughs> Right. Uh, what has the Colorado legislature done with this information, if anything? In, uh, in other words, uh, commission studies, et cetera. Uh, also, is there any industrial hemp being grown not for CBD in Colorado? Uh, last question first. Totally. Tons of industrial hemp being grown not for CBD. Um, interesting stuff. Most of it takes place on our eastern plains, um, not where I am, which Again, I'm all for. I recognize the difficulty of that for law enforcement. And a lot of my friends in this world get pissed when I say that. Um, but the, the only issue is that it, um, it's really, it looks, like a, it looks like a cousin that makes trouble for law enforcement. So the, the fact that it looks so much like weed is an issue. Um, as far as what the Colorado legislature has done, we, we're continually trying to, to chase the car on this. And the problem is that the industry is better funded and a hundred times smarter on what these, these products are. So they can, you know, make in effect subtle little changes inside of the law that any person, uh, you know, sitting in, in the chamber in the legislature might say, oh, that's a nice idea. Um, and they don't really understand the practical on the ground application to it. So the issue that we have here is we have allowed them to get so far ahead of us, both with money and with knowledge, that we're having a heck of a hard time um, actually regulating these things right and then the other thing that happens is you have somebody like um, our don't don't worry if you if you wait for me to um, if you get angry at a political statement I make don't worry because I'll make one about the other side at any moment you have people like <laughs> our uh, Senator Cory Gardner who at the beginning of this thing was this is terrible this is a bad idea no 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 and after about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars in donations from the cannabis industry in Colorado he's like well weed is awesome Colorado's doing great we know exactly what we're doing here so that's the nature a lot of the times of politics as well is where the money flows um, the vote go. Of course, not to you politicians on the call. You guys are well, well above that, I'm sure. Uh, and we are grateful that they're with us. Um, is there any age requirement to purchase THC products? 21. And you can purchase them online, isn't that correct? Yeah, not really. You can order them online and then go up and pick them, pick them up. Um, but what we've done, Colorado taught, or California taught the world how to do this. We now have um, delivery options, which are pretty profound. So if you want to see how that works, um, download an app called Weed Maps and um, look at how the delivery works, because that's pretty incredible. So yeah, you can order them online, but you still got to go to the store and pick them up. Got it. Okay. Um, but there are other, you can order paraphernalia, you can order vaping products, I know for sure, um, which a lot of times are hijacked and used to put in the THC oil, um, but, mm -hmm. but not the cannabis product you're saying. 
Um, are, law foods, are lawsuits starting to be filed against the industry for damages or injuries from marijuana use? Yes. Um, there have been several wrongful deaths. Um, there have been um, property value losses, um, employment issues. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, there's an old adage uh, that, that sometimes you have to let the wolf kill the fox. And um, the wolf in this case, I think, would be um, trial lawyers and lawsuits. It's the way we got through to the tobacco attorney. Um, the, the fox here is the industry behind it. So ultimately, yes, ultimately, we have to end up squaring up with this in the same way that we did with tobacco. Um, but we're not going to get there any other way than lawsuits, I don't think, which is, <laughs> I guess, the American way. Right. Yep. Um, so we had one, we had several advanced questions, many of them you've covered. Um, I, you may have touched on this, I apologize if I missed it. How much THC is sold black market compared to shops that are taxed in Colorado? I'm afraid you ask an impossible question to answer uh, because the nature of it is that it's it's black market and it's underground. Um, so we we don't know that, but we know that the black market in Colorado is considerably larger larger than it was pre legalization. Um, PBS did a great study on it, and NPR did a great piece on it. Um, lots of people have done pieces on it. It's easy to find. Um, we don't. No, uh, I think that uh, I could make a guess on that, but um, I'm not going to do it in a public format. Right. It's a really great question. Exactly how has the legalization affected youth use despite the age restriction in Colorado? Recently, a student tried to argue that if it were legal, it would decrease the rebellion of youth use. Hmm. That seems like a um, cute, idealistic thing that a child would say. I have three of them myself. <laughs> I could hear that argument coming from them. Uh, and in reality, the lower the perception of risk, the higher the youth use. I mean, we have uh, almost 100 years worth of um, survey data that shows us that. That, uh, that, sounds, that, that actually sounds like a kid that kind of wants to get high. Um, the, the issue always is that the, the less perceived harm, the more they use. And when you have dispensaries on every corner and when you have advertisements that you see everywhere, I mean, like the last Broncos game I went to, I went through with the kids and there literally was a plane flying over the stadium with uh, uh, weed advertisements behind it. Like, yeah, good luck convincing kids that it's um, not a good idea then um, your no uh, the youth use in Colorado has uh, is considerably higher than the rest of the country the youth use in Colorado has gone up considerably since we legalized the last thing uh, the the place I would direct you to would be the last monitoring the future survey um, Kim you're giving me some great ones but they're all kind of softballs isn't there anybody who's frustrated or has some like <laughs> uh, Let's see there. Challenged? Can you, uh, yes, Rebecca, it's uh, monitoring the future. So, right, okay, so can you provide a source for the increase in youth use? You just mentioned monitoring the future. But I'm wondering too, um, you know, we've heard about studies that show that in states where it's legalized, some studies are saying that youth use has gone down and other studies say that youth use has increased. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, there's a pretty big difference between a study and a survey and between the, okay, so for, for example, um, one always has to look to the real science of this. That's why I like to give them all a minute. There was some, um, there, there was some talk at the beginning that the numbers had gone down in Colorado. Uh, the great, David, that's a wonderful resource, the Haida one. Um, in reality, the survey that they did in Colorado that they showed fairly stagnant numbers of youth use had excluded all of Metro Denver as well as all of Boulder, um, whereas the, the ones before hadn't done that. So the parts of the um, state with high, obviously the highest use rates um, so uh, one of the things that we don't do a great job of in this country is reading the fine print. You know, we see a head and we're like, oh, fantastic. Um, actually take a look at the methodology behind that uh, is probably a good idea. Right. 
Um, I just shared that HIDA report with um, all of the attendees. So that's in the chat box. <clears throat> uh, could this become the new, or will this become the new form of medication assisted treatment? Um, well, <laughs> no, because Matt's got science behind it. Uh, and Matt is something that's actually prescribed by physicians. When we're saying Matt, we're talking about uh, buprenorphine and Vivitrol and things like this. Um, this is a, a, a non-prescribed, only recommended uh, substance that we know very, very little about. Now, maybe to the core of your question is, uh, or, or at least from my perspective, the core of it is, are people substituting? Um, the answer to that is yes, for sure. You've got a lot of folks who are um, you know, stepping down to THC, if you will. For those of us who work inside of chemical dependency, though, um, we don't like seeing people transfer. Uh, because it's not about the specific substance, it's about the feeling and the escape and the dopamine and the et cetera. Um, if, if you quit a drug and just start another one, um, you know, a lot of the times you miss the core. Right. And I think too, we, you know, we, one of our presenters uh, in July was uh, Joe Garbley, who's the medical director at Karen Treatment Center. And he, he was sharing with us that he does an entire presentation about how the fact that, that marijuana use as a harm reduction for cannabis use, I'm sorry, for opioid use disorder is, is absolutely not effective. In fact, increases um, opioid use in, his, in the studies that he's viewed. So. Um, it, it, it's, it's very true. And for those of you in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic who've been hit harder than the rest of us with the opiate crisis, um, you've got to under, like, we, we have macro level data that is valid and intense. And um, you actually, uh, at the individual level, you actually prime opiate receptors towards misuse. Okay, so um, the more THC you invest, the more you're sort of priming your opiate levels to do something wrong. Uh, and when you, when you look at it on, a, on a, a, a macro level, like when you look at societal level data, the more THC is used, the higher the, the abuse of opiates is. So this isn't something, and this is what's just tripping me out so much is everybody's doubling down on this. Like, okay, the opiates are getting worse. That means we have to decriminalize, legalize, let these things out there. The, um, wh whereas it really should be the other case. Um, Kim, I saw a question pop up and I didn't read the whole thing, but it was from a, a DARE officer. And if I can answer any questions for our law enforcement, I'd love to do that. Yep, yep, yep. It's, uh, where did it go? I'm looking in my feed. Uh, is DARE still being taught in schools in Colorado? Is LE trying to use, trying to uh, still educate students the dangers of THC use, law enforcement, so uh, educating students about the danger of THC use? Nope. Uh, in Boulder County, DARE hasn't been taught for two years, and we actually, three years, and last year, this was awesome. I actually asked my daughter to um, record her drug education classes because they've got their iPads and their everything. And um, we don't deliver an abstinence message for kids in my county anymore. I can't speak to the specifics of others. I go to a lot of different counties and do it, but there is no um, you shouldn't do drugs message in my county anymore, which is uh, <laughs> because Kids shouldn't do drugs, period. Anything that's not, uh, uh, anything that's going to alter that brain chemistry that's not um, a well understood medication prescribed and supervised by a physician should not be going into a premyelinated frontal lobe. Uh, ben, smoking is linked to the increase uh, of relapse. Would you agree that this is the same with marijuana use? Yes. Okay. Uh, issues that someone uh, who knows you is running into in Somerset County is the idea of youth thinking marijuana is not dangerous. It's a medicine, you know, and lots of times parents aren't educated. In fact, oftentimes parents are consumers. Uh, that's my ad, <laughs> add in. Uh, do you have the same attitudes in Colorado making prevention work difficult as there are so many surveys in, instead of science published and gaining attention? Yeah, totally. Um... Totally. And I, I mean, frankly, listen, I'm not trying to sell it because I think I make a dollar every time somebody buys one, but that's a part of why I wrote the book. 
because I've got some specific stuff in there on it. Um, but yes, we absolutely have to change the way that we discuss and engage with young people uh, okay. because they've gotten a different message. Right. I'm going to try to get through that. We have some more in the Q&A box here. How has legalization impacted the use of other substances? Uh, Colorado has never recorded higher numbers in the last five years. Uh, look, look at our overdose numbers. Look at our amphetamines. But uh, so this is one that causation or correlation, nobody can answer that. Uh, you know, from an addiction standpoint, polysubstance abuse is a really, really big thing. But then again, I've got pretty tremendous sample group bias working inside of a treatment facility. <laughs> it's been good for our business. Right. Can you discuss horizontal and vertical integration? And if Pennsylvania were to legalize, which would you think would be best for Pennsylvania given the current state of the industry within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? So I don't know anything about the state of the industry inside of the Commonwealth, but um, I'm not a big fan of seeing vertical integration. Horizontal, on the other hand, eh. listen, I like small, tiny, not well-funded corporations behind these things. And the more vertically or even horizontally integrated you get, the more money you stockpile. So like, like I'd mentioned before, I would much prefer to see an environment that was purely mom and pop and purely um, <laughs> inside of the communities in which they live. If the people who owned the dispensaries in my communities lived here, I think they would look and smell very differently. So um, I would be a fan of doing anything that you could to break up the, the form of the involvement of work. Something really just went really You have another device on? Okay, try that again. Try talking again. Sorry. It just got really... You're okay now. Yeah, that was weird. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, not at all. I was done. I was just rambling. Okay, you got really quiet now. I wonder what's going on with your audio. Okay. Um, all right, here's a question. Is there an opportunity for Pennsylvania implementation to have better outcomes because of first implementing medical marijuana and the use of the medical model as the starting point for recreational use? or recreational model. Of course. And, and I mean, Colorado had medical first. Of, of course there is. But the, and what I wrote in my book uh, is that if you're going to have a better outcome, you have to build the infrastructure prior to. This ex post facto law uh, application um, cannot work. So the, the, the fact that I, I would guess that most people don't even understand what's inside of all of the legislation that will be voted on is a big issue. Like to do this right, I, I was over in New Zealand last year um, with, with their uh, um, uh, MPs and their, their lawmakers and things considering how they could do this well and responsibly and intelligently. And it could be done, but, but you're sure not going to do it with the legislation that you got now because I've read it. Uh, and it shouldn't be written by lobbyists in the industry. There, that's about as much politics as I like getting into. Okay, got it. Um, are we able to prosecute for illegal use such as uh, parents who allow children to use child and family services um, didn't respond in regard to a 15 year old using. Yes, of course you are. You, you, you can, but um, I, again, it's a matter of bandwidth. Sure. Right. Um, so I know that you have to be on another meeting at 10 o'clock. So, um, and I know we still have some other questions. So I'm going to ask folks to please join us on October 15th. Um, submit any other questions you have that you would like Ben to answer to me on the email that is on, actually, and Judy, if you want to put my email in the chat box again, that would be great. Um, and, uh, and also the follow-up page, you know, we have a lot, we're going to be, we're going to and visit that frequently. We're going to continue to build it. We'll continue to add information um, about other questions that come in so that we can share that with everyone. 
and um, and also please visit the section called Who Knew on our on our website. We have a lot of data, a lot of research that's gone into understanding this, especially the impact on kids, which what uh, is what today's program is really and truly all about. Um, so we really encourage you to visit that as well. Ben, I cannot thank you enough. I'm, and I apologize again to everyone for the confusion with the sound and technology. You know, we're trying. Um, you're such a friend. Thank you so much for joining us again, as always. See you, Keystone State. <laughs>